How would you like to replace your income with a niche website? Hey, this is Joe Krause, host of the Buying Online Business Podcast. And in this episode, I'm talking with Carl Broadbent, who has a portfolio of profitable blogs, one of which he actually teaches others how to make money from their own niche websites. In this podcast episode, Carl and I talk about how and why he turned to the internet to make money online which is a very similar path to mine. We also talk about how to update our content for our niche websites. Then we also talk about how much content should we update versus how much content, new content should we create and what sort of ratio Carl likes to go by with building his uh, niche website businesses. Carl and I also dive into the topic of content cannibalization and how we can actually stop that from happening within our own structures, content structures and silos. Then Carl teaches us some of the mistakes that he's made with his niche websites and how we can avoid making those mistakes as well. And he looks at this with a long-term view, which I think is really important when you're looking to build a portfolio of, of sites that bring in a passive income for yourself. And then Carl starts to talk about how we can transform our content websites and niche websites into an actual community that thrives. And the byproduct of that being that it makes a decent amount of income. And lastly, we talk about why you should actually buy a content website instead of going through the startup phase and why Carl has bought websites before and why he continues and will continue to buy websites to skip past that startup phase. This is such a value episode. You're absolutely going to love it. But before we get stuck in, because we do talk about buying websites, you should never buy a website without doing proper website due diligence. So I suggest you go away and get my buying online businesses framework, which a lot of people have been raving about. I and all my clients use this framework to take the guesswork out of buying website businesses. So get that free framework at buyingonlinebusinesses.com forward slash free resources. There's other awesome free resources on that page too. So check that out. Let's dive in. Today's episode is brought to us by Niche Website Builders, which is a company a few of my clients are using and have used for content creation and link building services. They do everything from start to finish. So from keyword research all the way to uploading your completed article for you. We've also had Bob members buy ready-made affiliate sites built by Niche Website Builders. So if you're looking to outrank your competitors' content and build better backlinks, Niche Website Builders and I have a special deal for you. Head to nichewebsite.builders forward slash Bob. I'll put a link in the show notes for you. But again, that's www.nichewebsite dot builders forward slash Bob. Do you want to start investing in websites, but don't want to drop $20,000 on your first investment? Check out Odie's where you can buy premium age domains to build a website on and add Odie's done for you affiliate site package to help you grow your website and get seen. Instead of buying a crummy website that's been built to sell with no authority, buy a premium age domain with built-in authority, great SEO and fresh quality content for your website. Head to odys.global to check out their great deals. That's O-D-Y-S dot G-L-O-B-A-L. Link will be in the description too. Carl, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Oh, thank you very much How for inviting doing? me. Yes, pleasure to be here. Look, man, I've, I'm really excited for having a chat with you. We've already had a quick little discussion <laughs> off air and um, I'm just super stoked for you on how your progression of you know of growing online has happened uh and a lot of people listening to this are like yeah i want to i want to make an online income stream right that's what a lot of people on the on the podcast who are listening to it want so i want to ask you about how you about the process normally don't we don't really get into heroes journey stories on this podcast we get straight into the into the stuff that's that's working at the time and yeah. Um, you know, there's, there's quick bites of information that people love, but I think your story is, is going to be valuable for those, uh, listening. So why passive income? Why did you turn to the internet and, and what, what was your reason for wanting to do that? Um, my reason was I pretty much got handed my notice, a job that I had, or a career that I'd been building for a number of years. I got called into an office mm. and said, you're no longer needed. I was like, that, thank you for the past seven years, but you know, see you later. So I, I, I went back on the job hunt, just like anybody else would. And um, I was lucky enough to get a job pretty quickly. But I had a few weeks gap in between. And I just thought to myself, okay, I've just given seven years of my life to this company. It's got me nowhere. And now I'm going into another job. I'm going to have to spend another seven years building up my career again. 
Um, and who knows what would happen in this job. So I just thought, I just wonder if there's something different to do. So crazy as it might sound, and you know, there's probably everybody watching this podcast now has probably done this. I typed in how to make money online. <laughs> it's, it's as simple as that. And a video that popped up. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it seems crazy, doesn't it? You know, and it's, you know, it's guru status to say, you know what I mean? Make money online. But I truly thought Mm. it's, and I thought it's going to return a lot of search results that are all going to be scams and expensive courses and, you know, get rich quick schemes. Mm. I thought it's going to be. And luckily it wasn't. It was a video that basically just said, um, do you want to make a website? You can build a niche website and you can have it up and running in a number of hours and you can do it now and, and start today. And I was just like, okay. And I looked at the video and it was from Alex from WP Eagle, a YouTuber. And uh, it was a four hour yeah. video on how to make a website. And I literally just pressed play and I had my laptop and I just watched it on my phone. I then did some on my laptop, watched it again, did a bit more, paused it, did a bit more. And I just did this for a, a full day. And at the end of the day, I had a website. I just, I, I am the, I am a total internet and computer, you know, I, I don't know nothing about them. I really didn't, honestly. And, you know, my wife came home and she was like, what's mm. that? And I was like, a website. She's like, where did you get it from? Where did you buy it? I was like, I made it. I was like, don't be silly. You don't even know how to turn a computer on. Uh, and I did. And I made a website in about seven hours. And, and from then I was absolutely hooked. Obviously, I still had to start the new job. You know, I still had that, you know, I had a mm. website, but it wasn't making any money. Um, and I just started working on it each night and watching YouTube videos and, you know, going on webinars and reading books and slowly kind of pieced together that it is actually real. You can make money online, which, yeah, who, who knew? <laughs> who knew, right? Like it's, yeah. I, I was the same thing. I was living in Egypt at the time and I just didn't want to go back to plumbing. Um, yeah. And... I was like, I, I want to travel. I just want to continually travel and, and to do that, I need to make money online. So I just typed in how to travel the world and make money online. And mine was very similar. It popped up travel blogging. Um, people were travel blogging. I was like, oh, that's me. I'm done. Like I'm, yeah. I'm going to be a travel blogger. And that's how my journey started. <laughs> yeah. I wanted, yeah. You mentioned something um, pretty important that I, I like to, I guess people would say preach um, when, you're lying, when, when you're trying to make money online is you said you still needed to get a job because yeah. your website wasn't making money. How important yeah. was it to have a job's income, an income stream from a job whilst you were working this out? How well, was that? It, did you, did it you was find literally that pretty impossible. Important? I wouldn't have been able to do it. Without having a job and an income coming in, I wouldn't be able to do it. And, and I actually think part of my kind of success on YouTube was me saying to people that I was showing them that what I was doing, I was saying, right, okay, I, I, I got up at six this morning, I wrote for an hour, I went to work, I've done a 12 hour shift, I put the kids to bed, had some tea, and I'm going to write for another hour. And people's like, you know, the, yeah. the, you can't do this. You can't build a website, a successful website. Doing that's not possible. And I kind of documented on YouTube that what I was doing. And mm. some days I'm getting on YouTube and I was like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm absolutely shattered. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm done in today, but I'm just going to outline a post today. That's all I'll do. I've got half an hour and I'm and, and showing and telling people this. And then when they saw some success coming from my, my websites, then kind of people was like, okay, maybe you can work and do this part time, and you know that snowball effect of you know it makes a little bit of money, then you invest it and make a little bit more, and it, and it keeps growing. And I think that's what helps me mm. kind of with my channel that I showed and documented that you can have a nine to five job or a, you know a full time job and still do this. Yeah, yeah, I'm the same. I teach people the same when they're like trying to buy a business because I think when you're doing it without another income stream is the stress that you put on yourself to make it work can actually damage the productivity, damage the creativity and damage the results that you get um, when you're trying to do it without an, an income stream coming in because you're really got so much writing on it. <laughs> what yeah, do you think about yeah, that? And, and everything you have to do, it's no longer like, a, you know, it's no longer a calculated risk. It's, it's a risk that you can't afford to take mm. sometimes. So it stops you often progressing. And, you know, that fear of trying something different uh, and it not working when you've got limited time or resources, that genuinely can mm. hold you back. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So through that journey, you've got some sites and you're making your income now. And this is your this is your full-time thing. So congrats. Yeah. What are you, you from that from that, you know, that day 
where your wife came home and it's like, you build a website, that's not possible, to now, uh, what are some, like maybe two or three big mistakes that you think you've made as a content site owner that people, not not so much about the starting phase because a lot of people here are looking to buy these content sites, but yeah. as an owner and an operator of a content site, what do you think some of the things that, uh, that people should be looking out for or thinking about? I think some of the mistakes I've made uh, probably more recently was um, maybe getting ahead of myself with some niches, thinking that it's possible to kind of rank content in any topic or any niche. Sometimes you get a little bit of a state above your status and mm. think, yeah, I can do this. You know, I've, I recently did mm. a, uh, I call it my mega website. I had plans for putting thousands of articles on it. And I thought I'd test it with a good chunk of articles, 350, 400 articles, which to some people is kind of a lifetime's work to get 400 articles on a website. And I put this on mm. in a matter of months and expecting it to absolutely rock it, you know, come out of the Google sandbox or whatever, it would rock it. Uh, and it hasn't. <laughs> It hasn't done nothing for literally 12 months. It will yeah. index, uh, it, it's, it's struggling. So I think sometimes you possibly get a little bit ahead of yourself. Um, you think you, mm. you know it, you think you've got it nailed, you think you know the process, and then often it comes back to bite you. Uh, and that one has done. Uh, and then I think the other thing is, I think I've given up on some sites too early. And uh, when I say given up, not mm. totally given up, but sold them, got rid of them. When I think there's one or two sites I wish I'd have held on to, and uh, I ever see mm. what they're doing now and how successful they are now, or I'll look at them and think what I could have made of them. So yeah, I think mm -hmm. I think that shiny object syndrome where you see something new and you want to move on, or you know, or you see that cash incentive, you know, somebody offers you, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, somebody out of the blue just just emailed me and said I want to buy one of your sites you've got in your video, and I was like, okay, and I was like, you know his 30 grand or whatever it was you know what i mean i was just like okay i'm like done take it uh, and then i kind of wish now do you know what i should have just held on to it why did i take it you know yeah. would have been making fifteen thousand to twenty thousand a year every year so i think yeah selling sometimes mm -hmm. getting rid of them too early just just because you want to move on you know yeah I, i'm i'm a bit bad for that and wanting to move on to new things too quickly i think well, yeah, you've got the same thing as, as myself and so many of us is like the, the mm. curse of, I wouldn't say it's a curse, but we can we can drum it out of us is that that shiny, not just shiny object syndrome, but just being an entrepreneur or a visionary, we want to keep moving. Yeah. We want to be doing exciting new things. And what I've learned from people before, Carl, is that business, you know, a good business is a boring business Yeah, uh, yeah. where you do minimal work uh, and it makes good money. And yeah. there's minimal stress. Uh, yeah. And I'm just a huge advocate for that now. Uh, where I, whereas I used to be try a million different things, um, just see how much spaghetti I can cook up because I just want to cover this wall with as much spaghetti to see as ma see how many things can stick. Yeah. Um, which is just, that turns into a big massive mess really quickly. And, and we yeah. just end up yeah. running around in circles, right? Like those shiny object syndromes of, even just other places that you can make money online. There's so there's there's YouTube videos that, you know, twenty ways you can make money online and they're all can work. Yeah. But they all just take up so much time. Um and yeah. to get good at it, you at least need to carve out a few years to really start to get good at it, right? Yeah. I mean I, I've just I've just been filming a video today. I'm gonna to do like an end of year wrap up video. And I and I in there I say some of the failures and some of the things I don't think I've done right this year. And that is exactly one of them mm. that I've, I've spread myself so far. Uh, I was doing, you know, I was, one month I did 17 videos on YouTube uh, in a month, plus trying to run nine websites, plus wow. organize a, a, wow. an event, you know, plus do a, a, a mail newsletter, a mailing newsletter every month. So I literally had to try to juggle so many plates and... I think you just spread yourself so thin that you actually don't get anywhere with any of them. They're all kind of plateauing mm -hmm. rather than taking off. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I definitely think that is one thing that, you know, it's in my New Year's resolution in next year to really focus on a couple of things, a couple of core things in my business. Yeah, because I never did YouTube to have a... I never had a goal. It was never, I'm building an audience up to sell them a course or I'm building an audience up to... To, to do something, to, to have a membership group. It was nothing like that. I never had any plans and I still don't. Yeah. If somebody said to me, why have you got a YouTube channel? I'd probably actually struggle to answer that because 
I actually don't know. <laughs> it was just to document my mm. journey in the beginning, and then it's kind of grown a little bit from there. Uh, but yeah, I've definitely spread myself too thin this past year, for sure. Yeah, it's it's so easy to do, though, because what we get, I believe, what we get brought into is all of these podcasts and these YouTube videos and these blog posts and these influencers telling us that you need to do this thing in your business to grow it. And if you don't, you're going to get, you know, you, yeah. you're gone. Um, and then we go, wow, all right. Yeah. Make that make sense. We need to go and try add this thing onto our business and add that thing onto our business. Whereas in yeah. fact, if we look at our business and we tune into it, we can see, huh, there's actually like, a couple of pieces of content that worked really well that made up most of my income. Like let's, let's just do that more of that and less of what's not working and talking about content, Carl, big reason I wanted to get you on here is because you're the man for this. Um, I want to talk about content creation and how we can do this really well. Some SEO stuff as well, but once you've created content, how do you know, like uh, in a blog, on a niche site, how do you know what content is not ranking so well and doing so well and which ones you should cull and then which ones you should update? Yeah. I mean, for me, I update and I do it on a regular basis. I, I have a kind of a rolling month method. So I will each, every three months, we'll look at a certain number of content on a site, see if it needs refreshing, uh, updating. Basically, I just go by numbers. If a blog post for me is bringing anything over 200 page views a month, I don't touch it. It's enough. It's enough. You know, no no okay. piece of content. I haven't invested hundreds of dollars in a single piece of content that has to bring in a thousand, two thousand, three thousand uh, visits a month to be worth it. The majority of the content mm. I create mm. is anywhere from thirty dollars to eighty dollars a post. So if that brings in two two hundred page views per month, then it's fine. I'll leave it. I won't touch it. If it's under that then yeah, we can look at that. If it's only getting 50 page views or 100 page views, then it might be worth the time to actually update it and see if we can boost it. But what I would look at is the ranking positions on it. So if that's only getting 50 page views mm -hmm. a month, it might be position one, but it might just not be getting yeah. searched. So it might be a keyword or an article that you actually just leave there because you know what? Maybe that topic's gone out of, out of season. Uh, it's not being talked about. It's not in trending. It's not in fashion anymore, but maybe it will be next year. So there's various mm -hmm. factors, really. You have to look at it and think to yourself, you know, am I only getting 50 searches a month on that or 50 visitors a month on that because it's position seven? And fair enough. Then we need to see if we can knock it further up and will it jump it up into that 200 page views a month? Because I kind of go on a bit of a quantity basis. So I publish a lot of content. Uh, I kind of love mm -hmm. like John Dykstra's methodology where he just creates a ton of content. And he's the same. He doesn't yeah. have to be number one every article. It has to bring in a couple mm -hmm. hundred page views a month. Uh, and that's enough because when you've gotcha. got 700 articles on a website and they're all bringing in 200 page views a month or more, then you're doing well. So, yeah, that's how I do it, really. Looking at analytics, looking at data, okay. Google Search Console is one of the best things you can do. So since you create a lot of content, what's your ratio of new content created versus per month, I guess, is new pieces created per month versus updating, how many you update per month? What's like, do you have a ratio that you use? Not not so much a ratio, but I used to try and update around 20 to 25 articles per month. That's what I used to do. And then as the portfolio got bigger, it turns kind of into a three month process. So now I kind of just look yeah. on what websites are not doing well. So if a website in general seems to be on the decline, then I will we'll go into it. So at the minute I have one pet website that's, it's a case study, everybody knows about it. And it's been dropping, it's dropping off a cliff. The traffic's dropping off, no un understanding why. I've had every SEO expert look at it. None of us can figure it out. So I am going back over some of that content and we are refreshing that. So there's a lot mm -hmm. of focus on that site. So I'll pull some of my team off of writing new content and just put them on there. So rather than it being a fixed ratio, sometimes it's a bit of a crisis management. And if it's if it looks like something's you know negatively going down, then we'll jump on it. But you know, if we still see that green upward trend, it, you know, may not even review any of the content at that point. Yeah, it's a really good point. And so, say a site is going going you know downhill like that, and you need to update the content. What's some of the things that you 
typically do to update the content? Like you look at it, you order it, and then do you, what, what would you be changing to make this better? So number one, one of the biggest reasons content doesn't do well is it just doesn't meet the search, search intent that it's not hitting the target audience. So you may be getting clicks on it, but it might not be the people that want to read that content. So one of the main things I'm looking at, mm. is, is it relevant to that search? So is it coming up in search for the right topics and the right keywords? So the per person who reads that title, clicks it, they know what they're getting. If they're not getting what they yep. want, they're, they're gonna bounce and they're not gonna flick, click through to any more articles. So the main thing to me is looking at and as as a, a reader, looking at as if I've searched that. So I've seen that title in SERPs, I've clicked it, what am I getting? Uh, and am I happy with what I've mm -hmm. got? And half of the time, in fact, probably 75% of the time, it's not. It's not right, it's not meeting there. It's full of fluff, it's full of waffle, it's just not what they're after. And that's what we tend to look at. It, it doesn't tend to be anything more technical than that. You know, you could say, okay, we'll try and win um, extra snippets, we'll try and win secondary snippets. So we'll go after the main title snippet, we'll answer the question straight away. Then we'll go after H2 and H3 paragraphs and we'll try and win snippets in them paragraphs. So then, you know, do we need any more internal, external links? We can do all that. But the biggest failure usually is just, it's not what people expected to read when they clicked it. Wow, so that's basically the 80-20 of it is is just guess a clickbait. If your title's too clickbaity and they don't get the the result that they want from the article, is that yeah, or it could just or it could just be ranking for yeah. the wrong keyword. What you expected it to actually rank uh, for, it may not be. So you know, uh, yeah, a prime on. a prime example, you could be writing an article about let's say golf clubs. Uh, I'm a keen golfer and I used to have a golfing website. So let's say you know you might be writing an article about um, custom fitting of golf clubs. And uh, you write an mm. article about golf clubs and it primarily is ranking for, let's say, golf club grips. And you don't realize that because mm -hmm. you've not checked it. You just think it's getting traffic, so you leave it. But people are actually wanting to know, like, custom fitting of golf clubs. And that's what your article suggests. So they click that. And then all you're going on about is grips and angle lie and shaft, you know, materials. And it's not actually about the custom fitting process. So you've accidentally yeah. ranked for, for something you possibly is, are not targeting with that article. So, um, and that's usually, that's usually the problem that you're just not satisfying the reader with what they expected it to be. So, uh, and often that can be just a small change. Yeah. You know, you could just change the H2, the H1 heading. You could just change that and actually go, okay, well, 90% of the people are clicking on this, are wanting this information, but they're not getting it. They're getting this other information so I'll rebrand that a bit so that article suits them. So instead of upsetting 90% yeah. of the people, you know, you're now only upsetting 10% and you're, you know, a, a, a pleasing 90%. So sometimes it can be as simple as that. Yeah, cool. Cool. That's really good. I want to talk about content cannibalization. Yep. What is, for people that don't know what content cannibalization, what is it? What does it look like and how do we avoid that? Uh, usually you're just ranking two articles for a very similar keyword. So you might be yeah. trying to create, often people try and create like a silo or a, a, a structure of articles all around one keyword. Uh, but what they don't realize is often uh, they are negatively impacting an article that might be doing well. So you might have one article yeah. um, that's fighting against another one. And what happens is instead of both mm -hmm. of them going up the SERPs, what it actually does is cannibalizes both of them. It eats away at both of them. So both of them are pulled down. Mm -hmm the search rankings um, because they're constantly... And how do you Google. avoid that? Um, it, it is difficult. It is difficult to avoid it. And usually it's hard to spot as well that it's actually happening. And often people will just you yeah, know right. delete one of the articles and suddenly one article shoots to number one because it was being held wow. down and pulled down by the other one. Um, you know, technical SEO experts can probably find a way to figure it out. But yeah, I mean, usually it's just it's just tracking it through Google Search Console and see the rankings of both of those articles. It might be more. It might be you could have ten articles that are all fighting against each other. Uh, sometimes it's mm. worth combining them all into one, and then you find out one article goes up the SERPs rather than ten of them being pushed down to page three and and four. Um, so yeah, it it can get difficult. It can get hard to spot, and it's very very difficult for a publisher to delete something. That is one thing you'll find with all oh, publishers, yeah. the panic of deleting 
you know, uh, an article or cutting it down as well. Because you may find that if you've got cannibalization on a couple of articles, it might just be as simple as taking one paragraph out of one of those articles. But the thought of having to, mm-hmm. you know, delete a section of it, you know, can be terrifying because you've either paid for that article or you've spent a lot of time writing it. So it, it, but it is difficult. Yeah. I've not come across it a lot. I'll be honest. I've not had a lot of it on my site. Um, I think mm. it's just a case of I've not sometimes structured it correctly. So they're fighting against each other where I realize it probably would have been better combining it into one. But um, it is difficult to spot. I just want to pause this episode for an immediate update. Online business owners and website investors, SEO and digital marketing is changing forever. 2022 will not be the same as 2021. You can't miss the Buying and Building Online Businesses Summit. This is a free virtual event and we're going live on January 28th, 2022 with 12 world-class speakers from CEO of Flip Up, Blake Hutchison, Empire Flippers, e-commerce mastermind, Mike Jackness, SEO expert, Stefan Spencer, godfather of content marketing, Joe Paluzzi, and many, many more. Don't get left behind when buying or growing your online business in 2022. We're going live on January 28th, and you can register at buyingonlinebusinesses.co forward slash online summit that's buying online businesses.co forward slash online summit there'll be a link in the description too yeah cool so st- staying on content creation ai for content creation mm-hmm. do you use it um if you do use it why if you don't use it why not and where do you th- where do you see this going for bloggers and niche niche side owners content side owners mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, personally, I, I don't use it. I use it for, when it first came out, I tested it. But last year, the big craze, it all came into the public light. Everybody started using it. Uh, and I did try it. I did promote it a little bit. I was using it for things like YouTube intros, product descriptions, mm. uh, catchy titles, mm. blog titles. I was using it for that kind of thing. I did try and create actual full articles using it, but I struggled. I, I struggled. I found spending more time trying to get it to do what I want it to do, and I could have just I could have just wrote the article. So, and I, I fact when I, when I fact checked it a little bit, it again it wasn't brilliant. Now some people have learned to use it very well. So some people have learned to use the tools to the best of their ability. And I think that's what the problem is. I think sometimes we get these tools like Ahrefs and things like that. We don't have the skills to yeah. use them how they should be used mm-hmm. you know if you got the, mm-hmm. the you, if you got the developer of ahrefs and said right okay show me how to find keywords with this tool for x they would do it you know what i mean whereas if you asked yeah. you and i we would probably struggle and would and it'd probably take us so long to actually find them it might be time wasted so i think learning to use mm-hmm. those tools and i know there are some people who's doing really well with ai content content creators and I think they'll 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 do fine with it because they know how to use it to its best ability. But personally, I have a team of writers and you know, they're human beings who do proper physical research and, you know, and uh, fact yes. find and check everything. And if they don't, they're not gonna get paid. So they they do great work and I you know, I didn't want to get rid of my team and replace them with AI <laughs> tools. So, but I have nothing against them, to be honest. You know, if you can create a great piece of content, it's factually correct, it reads right, and it ranks well, you know, good luck to you. I do think it will be big in the future. I do think the next few years are going to, I think we will see some massive changes in it. I think the tools will get better. I think the usability of them will get better. Uh, And I have no doubt that it will be a serious tool for creators in the next couple of years. Uh, but right now, at the minute, I think it's still quite hard to actually use them to the fullest ability, really. Yeah, I've never played with them and I've never bothered just because I've heard so many people talk about that, Carl. Mm-hmm. It's like, there's just a lot of work in learning it and, and yeah. tweaking it. And, you know, it's very, at the moment, I think it's still too hard to really replace a human being mm-hmm. that knows about the con- the space that they're writing about and putting that thing that you can't actually see or yep. measure, which is love, yep. right? Putting yep. that little bit of love in, into those pieces of content. I wanted yeah, to ask you to, about... 
you know, you tend to find that con- sorry, you tend to find that content writers really passionate about the work that they do. So you know, they yeah. take pride in what they do. I, I've had to email a writer today and just say it, she, she cut off one of the sentences, so one of the paragraphs, the sentence, and she was devastated. You know, I got about four emails apologizing. You know, and yeah, I'll get straight on to it. And you know, she was absolutely devastated that she'd done it. You know, you don't get that from yeah. you don't get that from AI content. <laughs> <laughs> not at all. I was like, well, that's what happened and deal with it. <laughs> and with it. we won't even tell you that it happened. <laughs> yeah, ex- exactly. Exactly. Yeah. You know, so uh, I, I like, I do like that, yeah. you know, I, that interaction and, you know, the thought that, you know, somebody's put some pride into the work. But like I say, I'm, I'm not going to go on YouTube and slay AI content or anything like that. I think there are people making successes of mm. it and good luck to them. You know, mm. at, the, at the minute, it's not for me, mm. you know. If I can type a keyword in, press go, and it's absolutely perfect and factually correct, <laughs> uh, that, that, then we might talk, but at the minute, it's not. <laughs> yeah, that, that, and even, I think people should realize that when that does happen, the game's almost over because anybody can just do that um, or can do keyword research really well and then get an article. So it's, there's going to be those challenges with that too, I think. So yeah. I want to talk about, a content site and it not just being a content site with articles mm-hmm. um, but being a community because mm-hmm. this is becoming the standard for a good content site is building out a community. So how do we take a, a, a standard content site that say somebody might buy it that is about golfing and it's just a bunch of really good articles that rank quite well, but doesn't have a community. How do we, how do we bring that into the picture? I, I, I think by I think by personalising it. I mean, there's got to be some personalisation to mm. that website. If I'm doing you know mm. a website about golfing, I have some interest into it. Into it, then you've got to reach out. You've got to reach out to fellow people who are in the hobby or the sport. And you've got to get their interaction, and you've got to get them on board because people will see it. Um, I have a I have a fishing site, and I've just actually managed to get a writer who loves fishing. He just absolutely lives and breathes it, and you can just tell, you can just feel the kind of connection to the 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 articles mm-hmm. and the person. Uh, and I'm not saying everybody can reach out and find somebody who, a specialist in the whatever particular niche they're in. It is very hard. But I think you have to try and have that element. So whether it be product research you're doing, then getting your hands on the product, seeing the product, you know, actually living and breathing it before you write about it. If it's informational content, then reaching out and talking to people, you know, groups, Facebook groups and things like that, and try and get that connection, just reaching out to those groups. I had a perfect example. I had a skincare uh, website. This is what got me started right at the very beginning. And that was very personal. It was personal to me, personal to my family. Mm-hmm. And I reached out mm-hmm. to as many people as I could who had this skin condition. And I found a lady um, who was really suffering with this issue, but she had an amazing story. Um, she battled this condition and she went on to win like a, a Miss Beauty pageant contest. And she was featured in newspapers, TV documentaries and everything. And we got that connection. We got that connection and she then started writing for the website and it just made that website awesome. so personal. Anybody who read it just instantly mm. knew um, he's gone through this problem or he knows what my son's going through or he's he, mm-hmm. he's hit the nail on the head. We suffer from that. And it was great. Yeah. The, it wasn't salesy. It wasn't selling. Um, you could just feel the authenticity behind that website. And I think that was just because it yeah. was people living that condition and, uh, talking about it so yeah i think personalizing it in as much way as possible uh, and building that group uh, around it, it it can be done it can be done it is very difficult depends on what the niche is some people don't want to be involved some people might not mm-hmm. you know especially if it's around mm-hmm. kind of a lot of products and stuff like that people think it like say it's salesy and they're, they're just trying to get you on board because they want to use you as a sales platform so that can be difficult, mm-hmm. um, but sometimes the um, genuineness of you or your blog or your website can come across, uh, and then that's that really helps. I'm so glad you mentioned that. This is going to be a big eye opener for people listening, looking to buy buy a website business, a content site, or even start one. Is that a lot of people just want to make money online? They want to be behind the screen. 
and a lot of personalization in the last few years has been taken out of taken out of content sites a lot mm. um, good there's good ones out there that that have it which is good and they just crush it they do really well right and it's not so much about the the focus on making money it's about how do we really touch people, really help people, if it's, if it's just a good info article. And yeah, we can have ads on the site, but the main priority is helping somebody. And I think the people that go into it with that intention, without having to just be able to hide behind a screen, uh, you can do that with good writers though as well that can run it and build a community still like you said. So I think that's something that really needs to, I think a lot of people in our game really need to step it up in that in that area. What do you think about that, Carl? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, right at the beginning of this podcast, one of the things I said was, you know, I regretted letting some websites go too soon. That was one of them. Yeah. Now, I regret yeah. that because, you know, it wasn't a big money-making machine, but it helped people. It really it really touched people. Mm-hmm. It was getting featured. It won something like a second, I won't say the actual skin condition because it might give the website away and I, I sold the website. But yeah, it was um, it won like second place in like the the most helpful blog in that category, um, and it won that two years on a trot, and that which which was fantastic. It was getting featured in magazines, and it was really helping people. And like I say, that young lady who then started writing for me, it helped her. You know, for about three years, she said, "You've helped me through so many hard times just writing about my experience." Mm-hmm. And I was like, "No, no, no, no! You're helping mm-hmm. people by writing about." It. And she's like, "No, no, no! You've done me a favor." Uh, and it just, it was beautiful. And it just, and it grew from that. People could just see that it was such a genuine site. Um, and like I say, you know, there, there there was products on there for people to buy, but it wasn't pushed down the throat. The, the main emphasis of this was, again, sharing my experience, you know, with that medical condition that my family had. So I think it shone mm-hmm. through. I think people mm-hmm. could see that. Uh, and I, like I said, that was one of the sites I wish I had. I wish, wish I had kept hold of that one because... I still think, I mean, it is out, it's still out, out there, it's st- it still is helping people, but yeah, I think I could have added to it. I think I think we had more t- more ways to go on that. Yeah, I think we could have done a lot with mm-hmm. that sign and helped a lot of people. Yeah, good work. That's really good. I think the most valuable thing that you got from that may have been is that, you, you know, you realise that the, the difference of just being a website business and it actually being a resource and yep. putting love into that to make it a resource. Um, and then the the byproduct is, you know, it makes money. <laughs> yeah. I think that's, I, I, I that's mean, one I, I, thing I, that you probably learned. I'd be realistic. I'd be realistic with it. And it was never going to be the biggest site in that category. It was never going to rank all the yeah. medical websites that's out there, WebMD and stuff like that. It was, it was never, I, had, I would have to be realistic. And, and that's... What happened? It was like Ricky and Jim from Income School. It was them who kind of said to me, "Are you in it to make money, or you to kind of, you know, just do this as a hobby?" And at that time, I was like, "Okay, you know, I'm in it for a living. I need to make a living." They were like, "Well, you know, you need to make money, so we need to focus on some sites that's going to make you money. Uh, and this site's fine, yeah. but it's not going to make you a ton of money. It's going to help people, and you're fine. Keep it going if you want to do that. But if you want to make money online and do it for a living, then we can, you need to create something easier to to rank. There's easier websites to make money from. Uh, and that's primarily why I ended up selling it because the money that I got from that site, I used to launch my portfolio of, of websites. So there was no harm in it. It was done in good intentions. And um, But like I say, I do wish I probably had kept hold of that one. But there again, if I had, probably wouldn't be where I am now. So... <laughs> You know. I'm a big believer that everything happens for a reason. Yeah. Uh, and I, I wanted to ask, I want, last thing I want to ask you is about buying sites. Um, would you ever consider buying, or have you bought a website, or would you consider buying one? Um, in If so, why would you buy one over starting one? I have bought sites, but only small ones. I've never bought anything um, larger um, than... Five thousand dollars, something like that. So I think I've bought a few at three yeah. or four thousand. Yeah. Um, the reason I would buy them is just to to leapfrog, you know, the uh, the Google sandbox and that set six, seven, eight month waiting period that is painfully slow to go mm. through. I've actually started building a lot of sites now on age domains because I am I'm just so impatient, and I, yeah. that first six, seven months is. You know, you can see why so many people give up because, you know, I'm an experienced yes. content creator now. 
website builder. And even I get fed up and bored with that period, you know, and you know, after six months mm-hmm. of only barely getting a trickle of traffic, even I sometimes am ready, I'm ready to throw in the towel. So you can imagine what somebody's like on their first ever website and they're trying to go through that. So if you can buy a website where it's already getting traffic, it's got a few backlinks, and every time you press publish on a piece of content, it indexes. That's all I want. I'm not bothered about rankings. I just want to make sure that if I press publish on a piece of content, it Index. appears. It, you know, that's that's all I want. And if it can do that, um, then the floodgates are open. I can then just go at it. And that's what I tend to do uh, across all my sites. Whatever shows promise, we then pull our, our, our attention onto that and we throw everybody at that. Um, and I think that's what you get with buying a site. That if it is a genuine site and everything's clean on it, then the floodgates are open. It's like green light, go, 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 content, content, content. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great piece of advice for people that are like, I want to make money online. And they just six to seven months for somebody that knows what they're doing or even longer, um, you know, has experience, knows that it's going to take that long. It's still a long time frame for it to get indexed. And for somebody that's starting out, could you imagine? It must feel like six years, <laughs> right? So uh, it's, it's crazy, especially, especially if they're putting money into it. So if they're not writing themselves, when you tend to write yourself, yeah. the time goes quicker. Because if you're only managing to write one mm-hmm. article a week uh, or even two, six months flies by. You know, it just, it just goes. Mm-hmm. But if you're putting money into this, mm-hmm. so if you have a site that's brand new and then you spend... A thousand dollars on content in month one, and then month two you ramp it up and it's two thousand. Month three, by the time you get to month six, you know you're explaining to your partner that you've pumped ten grand into this site, and they go, "Great, what's it? What's it earning?" You go, "I've got four hundred visitors this month, and it's made three dollars or something." It's just crazy. It sounds <laughs> insane, and that's the point. Most people go, "You know, well, you know, let's let, stop or let's get rid of it and sell it, get his money back." Uh, so yeah, so jumping uh, jumping the gun by getting a buying a site, yeah, he's he's definitely an option. It's always an option. Yeah, awesome. Let's talk about your upcoming events. When is this event? What is the event? When and when is it? Because I'm I'm pretty excited for you with this. Yeah, I'm really I'm excited myself. Yeah, we we're talking before, weren't we, about it? It's pretty much the focus of yeah. my life at the minute. It's called the affiliate gathering, <laughs> uh, and it's um it's a we're calling it an expo. It's basically a like a conference, but it's not serious. It's where we're going to get a group of speakers together and a group of affiliate marketers, bloggers, YouTubers. And we're going to get together in May. So it's May 2020, Friday the 20th of May 2022. Uh, so next year, uh, we've got six months left at the time this is going out. And yeah, so looking forward to it. We've got some amazing guests. We've got Ricky from Income School, John Dykstra, uh, Ben Adler, Mealy Gardner, Leon Angus, Sean Mars. There's tons and tons of people there. Um, plus we've got some, we just announced some workshops that we're doing. So on the day, while there's presentations in the main hall, we're going to have some workshops going on as well. So we've got people like Tyler from Ezoic. It's going to come in and show you how to maximize your ad revenue on your website. We've got Fiverr mm. coming along. Uh, we've got niche website builders are going to do a workshop. So there are some fantastic things going on all day. It's going to be absolutely cra- crazy. There'll be things going on off, off all over the place. Um, it is also going to be filmed, so if you can attend in person, fantastic. That would be the best way to meet kind of like-minded people. Uh, if not, there is an online platform where you'll be able to. We're going to stream it all day. Now we're not just going to stream the main speaker. We're going to f- stream in the corridors. We're going to meet people. We're going to chat. We're just going to be interactive. Uh, we're going to you're going to be able to ask questions because we're going to have a Q and A session, and you're going to be able to online answer a question, and we'll be able to ask the the panelists and even people in the audience and it's going to be a fun atmosphere uh, and that's what I want to get across mm. it, it was called affiliate gathering because it's just a gathering of people it started mm. off like that <laughs> it started off me talking to about 20 um, bloggers and uh, affiliate marketers saying should we get together you know we've had a horrible year with covid and everything like that should we should we get together next year and it was like yeah let's do it and then I asked somebody else, oh, I'll come. Oh, okay, you come. Oh, and I'll come and he'll, I'll bring my friend. Okay. Before I knew it, it was like 50 people saying, okay, we're coming. I was like, we're okay, we might have to extend this and make it something a little bit bigger. I remember um, you asked me if there's anybody that you thought would be, uh, you know, would like, might like to come. 
Uh, and I was like, yeah, what about these guys? And you're like, yeah, they're, they're coming. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. okay. Yeah. And then when well, you told me, when you told me the lot, the list, I was like, well, a lot of people have been on the podcast, so I don't have much, much people to contribute anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, people, you know, Ricky, Ricky from income school was one of my first choices. Cause I, I know Ricky, mm. uh, from my past experience, I won a competition with him. They pretty much got me started in this whole business. So yeah, I personally know Ricky's a great guy. And um, yeah, Ricky jumped at the opportunity. I think it's a good way for some of the speakers to also reach out to their audience because they have some of them have membership groups, um, some of them have a YouTube audience. Um, but it's not just the speakers; the amount of influencers and people that's going to be there is crazy. There's some people that um, I, I know are coming who just I kind of I haven't even announced it, haven't even said anything. They've just bought tickets, and I've seen the names on the list. It's like wow. They're coming. They would be on stage. <laughs> if I'd have known, you'd have been on stage. But mm. they're just showing up. So mm. not only are you going to make, meet the people that are on the speaker list, but you're also going to meet people in the audience and the crowds. And uh, I think that would be a great way to you know see some of these people that you've either read about or seen on YouTube uh, and just interact and just ask them questions you've always wanted to ask them. They're going to be there in person. Just Just ask them. That's awesome. So where can we send people to, to check this out? Uh, affiliategathering.com yeah just go to affiliategathering.com cool. and you'll see ticket sales are on there all the information's on there um tickets are selling really well i'm really pleased so i think it is it will definitely be i think pretty much sold out and like i say six months left to go but if you can't make it in person get the online ticket because it will be interactive and at the end of the day as well all the um the workshops are not going to be live but they will be um recorded so that if you buy an online ticket or you come in person, everybody will get a downloaded, edited version of the whole event. So you'll get it. You'll get it all. So if you don't get to see a certain workshop or a certain speaker on stage, you'll be able to watch it back with your own personal copy of the the whole event. So uh, no expense has been spared on the filming. It's it's a very professional team that's involved in that. It, this is not just me behind the scenes trying to arrange this. There is a a full conference team management team that I've got that uh, we've employed that are running cool. the, the whole uh, show behind the scenes. And then we have a full professional film crew that's coming in on the day um, to do the whole live streaming and filming. So, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited. Awesome. I'm getting slightly nervous now, um, but probably more excited than nervous. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Awesome, guys. Check that out. Go to that link. It'll be in the description. Carl, thank you so much for coming on the show. For people that are listening, please think about two to three people that – either own a content site or are going to own a content site in the future and share this podcast episode with them so they can learn what you know what mistakes they can avoid and what they can do to set themselves up for success with their content sites that's it guys speak to you soon bye hey youtube watcher if you thought that video is good you should check out this video here on the two best types of websites beginners should buy or check out my playlist on how i made my first 100k from buying websites and how to do due diligence. Check it out, it's an awesome playlist, you'll enjoy it.